Hello, I'm here at Embedded World 2025 and I've popped by the Arrow booth to have a chat about AI. And I'm here with George. So George, thanks very much for, for chatting with me. How are you? I'm very well, thank you Paige. And thank you so much for the opportunity to tell you more about the AI we have here. You're very welcome. So I look after AI globally with Arrow uh, as their technology leader focused on processing AI and FPGA. So what I would like to start with showing you is the breadth of AI and the different types of models that can run on different devices. So starting here, we have some simple microcontrollers controllers with Cortex-M devices, and what we can see is them running an anomaly detection. So at the moment, the built's running fine, but if we interrupt the built, we will detect that there's anomaly, and then it will restart. So moving on, we're now looking at the next level up, which is a microcontroller with a neural processing unit. The neural processing unit allows much more complicated AI algorithms to run, and in this case, we're running human pose estimation. Now, if we move through to here, what we have here is a model uh, running generative AI at the edge. And until, you know, if we were speaking two years ago, generative AI was very much something that would only ever be run online. Yeah. So being able to run it on the edge is quite exciting. So if I just capture. We can then ask the AI model what does it see and what it's captured. And as we stand here, it will start to fill in this, describing the scene. So we can come back to this in a moment um, once it's finished. So now here, we're working with um, the Qualcomm Dragon Wing. Now, most people have heard of Qualcomm Snapdragon yep. because it's in pretty much everybody's phone. So the Dragon Wing is the industrial business-to-business -business version of, of those types of chips. Uh, multiple processors, AI workloads, vision, audio. Now, what we're running on this is mono depth perception. Okay. Normally when we think of depth perception, we're working with two cameras, just like the two human eyes to work out how far something is. Yep. So it's actually a very complicated AI problem to do depth perception using just a single camera. And we can see here that we're running this on average about 30 frames a second. Uh, and bearing in mind that this is running on a very lightweight platform, very easy to put into a drone or another AMR, and it gives us some very exciting results. If we pop back now to the SEMA demo, we can see that it's completed uh, describing what it can see. And you know, and this is like I said, this is all generated on the device, okay. not running online. Yep. If we now continue to move across, um, we're now looking at the NVIDIA Jetson, and of course, NVIDIA is considered, you know, and it's probably one of the most recognized global brands when we look at AI. Yeah. Often people think about, you know, the, the, the data centers and, and, the, and the large language models and things that are run um, on large NVIDIA uh, processing stations. Here we're running on the embedded Jetson. We're processing three different video images. Uh, one of them's live, the other two are pre-recorded. Now, what's really interesting is that we're used to seeing these sort of images with, with bounding boxes. However, this, these models have not been trained specifically for what they're seeing now. And instead, we can actually change what it's looking for, and it'll find it live. So at the moment, um, we, we've got human face, human smile, and glasses, but we haven't got hand. So I put my hand up. Oh, I see. And it, and it doesn't draw a box. Yeah. Okay, so you're asking it to look for a human hand now. Yep, and so straight away, look, it's detecting the hands here. Oh, of course, yeah. And then my hand as it comes up. Yep. Uh, and so, and it's the same with all of these. So what it's detecting is based on first understanding the English language that of what I'm asking for, and then using vision transformers to find that in a live feed. Fantastic. So, last but not least, let's have a look at this tool from Edge Impulse. Often when I talk to customers about AI, they're often not sure where to begin their AI journey. So this tool from Edge Impulse allows you to go through the AI journey from data acquisition through training to deployment and targeting lots of different devices. What we can see here is I'm using it uh, on a breaking glass demo. And so you think to yourself, right, so first of all, I need to go and record breaking glass in lots of different places to generate the samples. Yeah. And traditionally, that's how we've done it. However, now we can be a little bit more intelligent about it, and instead we can ask a, a, a generative AI system, a little bit like ChatGPT, to instead generate the breaking glass for us. Excellent. So that way, it's generating the data, and then we're training with this data, and it saves us a lot of effort. You can imagine how useful this might be if you've trained it to work in a particular environment, yeah. and now you're selling your product in a different environment. You can say, hi, can you generate breaking glass 
as it might be at an airport or how it might sound in a warehouse, you get lots of additional samples and you can then train. Yeah. Once you've gone through the training, uh, you can see the results of the training here. And then what is very exciting about this demo is you can then choose where you want to run that model. Okay. So you can see if we were going to run this model on a dragon wing, we're getting an inference time of one milliseconds, which is clearly very fast, way faster than we'd need. Um, so instead we could choose to you know, run this on a much simpler device. And we can see that it runs at a, at a different inference yeah, speed. Yeah, fantastic. Um, very new use, Edge Impulse is, re is, is in the process of being acquired by Qualcomm, yep. and which is great because it means all the people that are used to using Edge Impulse for microcontrollers can now also target Qualcomm Dragonwing devices. Yeah. Fantastic. So, Paige, hopefully that's been really interesting. Yes. If there, is there anything else you would like to know? Yeah, I'm kind of interested in, in what challenges your customers are currently facing when, when building or designing AI, AI yep. products. So, um, like I said, um, a little bit of it's the journey itself. So, a lot of customers, they want to do AI. It's, it's, it's going to provide a really unique feature for their product but they haven't done AI before. Yeah. And often when you want to do something new that you've not done before, maybe the first thing you think is, right, well, we need to hire a couple of extra engineers. Yeah. It's really difficult to hire a couple of extra embedded engineers. So one of the things that we do at Aro is that we offer engineering services. And we have two models for that. One is like a full, kind of what you consider like a normal engineering services offering, where you give us your problem um, and specify it, we go away, we solve it, and we give you a solution. Yeah. And for a lot of customers, that's ideal. However, we also, um, or um, offer, I guess what you could call like an engineering services light, where what we do instead is we work with your team to improve their capability and uplift them, maybe provide some proof of concepts, use um, the, the great tools from our suppliers to build them initial chain, and that then allows them to go ahead and solve the problems for themselves. Fantastic. But in general, it's how you start and how you get the capacity to actually create the models. And how do you see AI evolving over, say, the next five years? Gosh. Five years when you talk about AI is a really far way to look. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't think people could have predicted two years ago what it can do today. Good point. So what I see it doing is making our lives better and easier in general by being able to predict what's going on, understand the world around it, and provide us information to allow us to make better decisions based on the world around us. Yeah. I know that's a little bit of a, um, a general answer, but it's very hard to be specific. If we want to talk technology, some of the great technology that are coming out at the moment is called um, event-based um, AI engines. So yeah. you might hear them called neuromorphic, but basically instead of working the way all chips have traditionally worked where they're synchronous, they just they just react when they, when they detect a change. Uh, this is more human-like and it allows for faster frequencies. Yeah. Um, and so I think in the future we'll see more neuromorphic processors. Um, they're probably commercially and maybe like three to four years. Yeah. Well, I'll come back to you in five years and we'll see, we'll see where we're at. Yeah, I wonder how we'll both be dressed and whether we'll even be at an event like we this. We'll be here virtually as an avatar. Absolutely. Pierre, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. No, thank you very much. Enjoy the show. You too. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Bye. Bye.